Blessed is our God at all times, both now and ever, and into ages of ages. Amen. O Master who loves mankind, illuminate our hearts with the pure light of your divine knowledge and open the eyes of our mind to understand the teachings of your holy scriptures and so us also the fear of your blessed commandments that we may overcome all carnal desires, entering upon a spiritual life and understanding and acting in all things according to your holy will. For you are the enlightenment of our souls and bodies, O Christ God. And to you we have glory together with your eternal Father and your all holy, gracious, and life being spirit, both now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Welcome back to all of our participants here. <laughs> I am, by the way, still a little bit under the weather. Last week, I was coughing a bit, and I apologized. In between then and now, I'm on the z pack and steroids. Nice. But I'm doing better. And uh, but, uh, but nevertheless, if I start coughing and things, I apologize. Annie Mitchell, blessing to be with you here. Likewise, Father Hezekiah, glad you're standing. Yes, I, I'm standing. We're now on the third Sunday of Green Vestments, uh, yes. and um, and otherwise known as ordinary time. But as we said last week, we're just continuing mm-hmm. on, right? We're living out in the light of the of theophany of the baptism of the Lord, this reality and this the, of Christ's mission, and we see it so beautifully here. As Jesus is going to now having been baptized in the Jordan River, is going to head up into Galilee. And we're going to prepare for that through the Old Testament reading that we all know from the New Testament. Yes. About Zebulun and Naphtali and Star Trek and all these other things. I mean, that's what most people, I think, Zebulun and Naphtali, right? It's like, yeah, I know. It it does sound very like Star Trek. Um, Can I ask you a question? What color vestments are you wearing this time of year? We have a completely different pattern of, of, of colors. Well, I, yeah. We, we basically, we follow the ancient tradition of having dark and light vestments. That's it. So you have light vestments oh. for festal times and dark vestments for fasting times. And, uh, and so right now we're in a f- feasting time. And so we wear light vestments. So it's nice. Cause then I get to go and choose my vestment every Sunday. And like, I like that one, you know, it's like, Oh, so. cool. So you just, as long as it's light, you can wear it. Yeah. Light that's colors. awesome. Nice. Cool. Yeah. 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 That's convenient. A lot of freedom there. Especially if you got nice light vestments. Yeah. I don't mean light, like light. I mean, light, like brilliant, you right. know, brilliant. Let's light go. Brilliant. Isaiah chapter eight, right? <clears throat> Correct. This is for the third Sunday in ordinary time, which by the way, uh, has been called Sunday of the word of God. So it's devoted to the Bible. Unlike so, other Sundays, I guess. Unlike <laughs> I guess you could say that. All right. I'm not making any comment. I say nothing. (laughs) Isaiah chapter 8, verse 23. Isaiah chapter 8 will be the first reading, verse 23, and we will read through Isaiah chapter 9, verse 3. The responsorial psalm comes from Psalm 27. Our gospel for this weekend is Matthew chapter 4, verses 12 through 23. And the epistle is 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 10 through 13, and then verse 17. So here we go. Shall we jump into Isaiah? Please, Father Isaiah Christ. chapter 8, eight. verse 23. 23. Here we go. Which is a little confusing, by the way, in my Bible. Wow. which is a RSV. So some people may be confused that there is no verse 23 in your RSV. And so they're gonna, you're going to say, they cut the verse out of the Bible. It's just counting it differently. So the verses and chapters are late editions. Don't worry about those things. It gets very confusing here between the end of the chapter, whatever. Pick it up somewhere right around. If you got your Bible handy in chapter 8, verse 22. If you have a New American, you have verse 23. Whatever the case may be, let's go ahead and start reading it. Okay, good. All right, here we go. First, the Lord degraded the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the end, he has glorified the seaward road, the land west of the Jordan, the district of the Gentiles. Anguish has taken wing, dispelled is darkness, for there is no gloom where but now there was distress. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light, 
Upon those who dwell in the land of gloom, a light has shone. You have brought them abundant joy and great rejoicing as they rejoice before you as at the harvest, as people make merry when dividing spoils. For the yoke that burdened them, the pole on their shoulder, and the rod of their taskmaster, you have smashed as on the day of Midian. All right, Father, I think it's time to get out a Bible map because I want to know where these places are. Where is Zebulun? Where is Naphtali? Nice. And what do we need to know about these places to kind of better not, understand this not, prophecy? Not only Zebulun, Naphtali, but the way of the sea. This is the Via Maris, the, well, the, the way of the sea. I just changed my languages. So it's, it's a trade route that, run, that runs, well, basically it's the uh, Fertile Crescent coming around right out of out of the north and out of the east coming through and all the way to the sea which is going to run right through Capernaum and that area and out to the sea for the trade routes to go out into the world right so all of the glories of the east coming to other area most people don't realize this that Capernaum in that area just on the northern part of the Sea of Galilee we're going to pull up the map here see okay now you see the Sea of Galilee and you see the, the 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 western side of the sea and this Via Maris path that comes right through that area and right out into the sea where they're going to take all the goods out. So this was the ancient highways. OK, uh, so that's one thing. This is not by accident. Jesus goes to Capernaum. Right. Mm. And so uh, then what Naphtali and Zebulun, these are two of the tribes, of course. I'll pull up the map here of the tri the 12 tribes of Israel. You'll see. Naphtali and Zebulun there, as we've talked about before, oftentimes well-known cities or well-known people become identified with larger geographic areas. Mm -hmm. Judah, well, Judah is one of the sons of Israel, of Jacob, who receives the blessing of the head of the family. Judah also then is the territory of Judah. Right. By which we come to know the Jews, right? In the north, Samaria, we've talked about that. Samaria is the, the hill that becomes the throne city in the north after the schism with King Solomon's son, right? Between yeah. Jeroboam and Rehoboam, there's a schism in Samaria. But Samaria is the whole north, right? Sure. Or we'll hear of Ephraim. Ephraim is one of the sons of Joseph, right? Joseph has two sons. They receive land in the apportioning of the land. Joseph's sons do, right? Why? It still ends up with 12 tribes, right? Because the Levites don't receive land technically. Oh, yeah. They do actually. They receive the choicest land. They receive the Temple Mount, right? Sure. They have the land of the land of the land. But as far as the land allotments are concerned and the names associated with them, the Levites don't receive anything. And who else? What other son doesn't receive anything? Joseph. Oh, of course. Because yeah. he actually receives a double portion. Sure. Manasseh, right? And Ephraim, yeah. his two sons, who receive the blessing from Jacob, their grandfather, before he dies, when he crosses his hands in the sign of the cross and lays his hands over the heads of the, that was St. Ephraim, I think, says that. He, he crossed oh. his hands, making the sign of the cross yeah. over the sons of Joseph. Anyways, that's a side, that's a side, uh, a side comment. And, um, but, but now Ephraim is going to be identified with the north and so we'll talk about we'll see that coming out here in the in the passage of, uh, with this application of Ephraim as a name for the north okay so when we're talking about Zebulun and Naphtali they're just the guys in the north just think they're the northernmost in a sense people of God and they're in a, they're in darkness why that's the big question right so this right. Is basically I'm just want to answer those questions because God gave them a big F right he degraded <laughs> the translation of the new number. He degraded Zebulun and Naphtali. He gave them the F minus. You guys did not make the cut. Okay. Yeah. And uh, yeah, obviously not exactly degraded, but he, he humbled them, if you will. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Wow. Okay. So can you give us a sense now to to get our context here? I mean, I know we've been in Isaiah a lot lately, but how does this passage sort of fit into the greater context, fit into the greater context of Isaiah? Okay, we 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 did this we did this a week ago. Not a week ago. We did this like two weeks ago, three weeks ago. But if your mind is like mine, it's in one side, it's out the other. I had to go back and do some reading again. So I'm just gonna help you real quick because it's one of those moments in salvation history. It's 
it's like, come, well, you want to make sure you get it, right? And here, I want to go back to Isaiah chapter uh, chapter 7, okay? Uh, in the days of Ahaz, son of Jotham. Now, what do we know about Ahaz? Well, keep He's your hand no. there in Isaiah 7. <laughs> go back with me to 2 Kings chapter 16. Because remember, there's your context. Keep your hand there. And what, what all you need to know about him is 16 verse 3. He, he he offered his sons in sacrifice. Okay, the guy was the guy was bad news. Okay, mm-hmm. he even burned his sons in offering according to the abominable practice of the nations whom the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. Um, Ahaz was was a disaster. Ahaz does end up having a son though, right? The Who's righteous, the righteous, amazing, amazing. One of the greatest kings in the history of salvation. King Hezekiah, and uh, but 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 before that happens, he's a total disaster. And here in second, in, in I'm keeping my hand then in Second Kings chapter sixteen and in Isaiah chapter seven, which is where I want to look at right now. Look at this: In the days of Ahaz, son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, Re- reason, 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 the king of Syria, who's north, right? Mm-hmm. And Pika, son of Ramalia, king of Israel, that's the northern 12 tribes, came up to Jerusalem to wage war against it. Okay. And now what happens? Ahaz starts quaking in his boots. What's going to happen? So, what does Ahaz do? Does he turn to the Lord? No, because Ahaz is bad news. Go back to 2 Kings chapter 16. Chapter 16, verse 5. Then Rezin, king of Syria, and Pekah, king of Ramalia, uh, king of Israel, son of Ramalia, king of Israel, came up to wage war in Jerusalem. Same line, right? Yeah. Good. Come down with me to verse 7. So Ahaz is quaking in his boots, sends messengers to Tiglath-Pileser, king of Assyria, saying, I'm your servant and your son. Come up and rescue me. And then look what he does. He ends up in the verses eight and nine, he ends up giving away the, the, the house, right? He starts tearing apart the house of God, the temple of God, and sending it to the king in Assyria as tribute, right? For protection instead of trusting in the Lord. And this is what happens in, 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 in Isaiah chapter seven. Isaiah goes to him and says, ask the Lord for a sign. You're going to be all right, Ahaz. Don't, look, if you just turn to God, he'll protect you against Israel and against Syria. Don't go and yoke yourself to the foreign power. But Ahaz is godless because Ahaz is worshiping false gods already. Ahaz says, no, I don't ask for a sign, right? I, 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 see, I won't he, tempt our God. I'm not going to okay. tempt our God, right? He's a not, he, the guys, we've already gone over this, right? And then, of course, God says to him, I'm giving you a sign anyways. Okay. There's going to be one born who's going to be a God with us, God with his people. Right. And who is going to be born that's going to save his people? But he has his own son. Now he's been killing his sons. So you can see the tension here. Okay. And a, of course, it's going to, Hezekiah is going to be born. So there's, 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 look, I've said this before. The prophet always is prophesying about his time that he's living in, the situation going on around him. But then by extension, then his prophecy is ultimately fulfilled because it's not only his word, but it's the word of God fulfilled in the restoration of all things. So Isaiah can talk about two different people. He can talk about those that are going to save God's people from total disaster at that time, if they turn to him and ultimately the one who's going to save God's people being Jesus, right? So Hezekiah is a, is in a sense, a foreshadowing in the coming of Christ. What's going to happen now? Assyria is going to end up coming and conquering the north. Okay. And he's going to try to conquer Jerusalem. They're going to come down. He's going to come around Jerusalem. He's going to surround the city in the time of Hezekiah. And Hezekiah is going to save his people from disaster. And the Assyrians are going to be destroyed and they're going to flee. Okay. This is so fundamentally important because you have to understand that when, when, when this geographically, Assyria is going to come down and conquer the north, which means they are going to be in darkness, right? And who's going to save them from that darkness? 
Hezekiah is going to turn them back and they're going to drive the Assyrians not only out of Jerusalem, but beyond the north back and, and ultimately the Assyrians are going to fall apart after this. Okay, so who the, the great light that's going to come to the north and bring the truth of God to them ultimately, or not say ultimately, is going to be Hezekiah. Hezekiah is going to actually send uh, letters to the north. We can see this in second, if you guys are into this, go into second Chronicles. I wrote this down. It's over here. Second Chronicles chapter 29. Second Chronicles chapter 29. Oh, yeah. Look at a couple of verses about Hezekiah. It's important. I want to go actually to 2 Kings chapter 18, chapter 18, verse 7. And the Lord was with him wherever he went. Okay, this is fun. Mm -hmm. what, what does that make you think of, Annie? God is with us. Wherever right? Yeah. Which is, we're, we're going to run into Isaiah chapter 7. That this yeah. one that's going to come is going to be Emmanuel. And you see that here in Second Kings chapter 18, where God is with him wherever he goes, right? God is with oh, his yeah. people again, wherever Hezekiah goes. So if, if any of you are like, Father Hezekiah, you're being ridiculous. This has this to talk about Jesus. I'm not saying it doesn't talk about Jesus. It does. Jesus is, is, it is God with us. But Hezekiah has God with him. Yeah, among the people. So he's the beginning of the revelation of this, this whole thing. But look at Second Second Chronicles chapter 20, sorry, chapter 30. Hezekiah sent to all Israel and Judah and wrote letters also to Ephraim and Manasseh. That, mm. That's the north, right? And that they should come to the house of the Lord in Jerusalem to keep the Passover to the Lord, the God of Israel. So do you see Hezekiah is bringing the light into the darkness to the people that sat in the shadow of darkness. Now, now we can understand our passage, Isaiah chapter nine, right? But there will be no gloom for her that was in anguish. In the former times, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and Naphtali. But in the latter time, he will make glorious the way of the sea. Well, what is the way of the sea? It's Zebulun and Naphtali. Hmm. Okay, it's the it's the Via Maris. Yeah. Okay. The way is the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the of the nations, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land deep darkness, on them has light shined. Okay. And so, and and who is he? Look, verse seven. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom. It to establish it and to uphold it. See what I'm saying? This is the king. So, so we have to understand this now in its proper historical context before we go apply it to Jesus. But once we know it in its historical context, the Assyrians come down and conquered, right? There's a foreign power who's governing the people. He's holding them in oppression. They are in darkness. And suddenly into that darkness comes the most unexpected revelation. And that is that God has not abandoned his people. And that means that the light is, is, is going to all of a sudden break out and God's enemies are going to be destroyed. Now, I'm, you're gonna, your head's going to blow off now for the rest of this passage because there's another reference that's given to us in this passage that's critically important for this image of the light coming into that darkness. And suddenly the darkness is scattered. The foreign power is thrown out. And what is that? It's at the end of our passage. Oh, is that the day of Midian? I, I wanted to ask, Did you ask yourself. This. What's the day of Midian? What's the day of Midian. Yeah. What's the day of Midian? Hello, Bible thumpers at the ICC. The day of Midian? The restoration yes. of God's people over the yeah. Midianites? First of all, who are the Midianites? Remember, re re remember re the, the, the famous guy that encounters the Midians is Moses, who marries a Midianite woman. But the Midianites are, of course, traveling out there in the deserts, just like the Amorites and Hittites and everybody like that. So ultimately they're going to be a problem for God's people and they're going to be a problem for them in Judges chapter seven. Mm -hmm. Yes. You remember the story, Annie? Yeah. Right. Let's go there real quick. Judges chapter seven, because this is cool stuff. Once you realize what's going on, remember judges, they've come back in the Holy land. The judges are, are, judging them they're trying to establish themselves but they're being attacked from all sides and in, in judges chapter seven they have a little 
a little situation here with guess who the Midianites, right? Mm -hmm. And this is the story of Gideon who, who, who gathers God's people to him. Now I'm just going to give you, you go read it for yourself. It's so cool. Gideon gathers God's people to himself and says, we're outnumbered. The Midianites are going to completely conquer us. And God says, take it easy, Gideon. And then goes about trimming down Gideon's armies to make it smaller and smaller and smaller till Gideon's only, he's like, he sends people back home. He says, get out. We don't need so many soldiers in the, in the, in the, in the camp. Get out of here. Go home. You go get, 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 get until he's got only 300 guys. He's got this little group of soldiers. And now God says, now we're going to go conquer the Midianites because you guys are a bunch of faithless morons. Don't it would just put your trust in me. And the only way they would put their trust in him is if God made them realize how impossible it was and then yeah. did it anyways, right? Think Ahaz and think of the Assyrian army coming down. Think of, of, of King Hezekiah and the darknesses in, in, enveloped the, the whole thing. And then we're going to think about the gospel of Jesus Christ that we're going to encounter. So what happens to these 300 guys? They go out there with trumpets and they go out there with a torch but over the torch they put a clay jar so that the torch is in darkness wow. and they encamp they go and they encircle around the camp of the midianites in the middle of the night yeah they blow the trumpets and they break the, the the clay jar and suddenly the light comes shining in the darkness and the midianites freak out because all around them 300 trumpets 300 torches everywhere they look there's there's a soldier and they lose it and god's the, the 300 soldiers pull out their swords and just start cutting them out and the midianites are completely destroyed okay the, that's the days of midian okay and that's what Isaiah is talking about is about to happen. God is going to send one who is Emmanuel, God with us into the darkness. And he's going to cast out the foreign power that seems so impossible. The Assyrian army was the greatest army the world had ever known. And, 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 in, the, and in the middle of the night, the, their army is going to be destroyed around Jerusalem and they're going to flee out of Jerusalem. They're going to flee to the north and the whole empire is going to fall apart all because of Hezekiah's faithfulness. Okay. In that, the clay jar of his humanity, God is dwelling. Do you see that? Yeah. And now we can turn and start to understand what Jesus is talking about in the New Testament. Okay, wow. having come out of the baptism, Lord. But before we get there, of course, we have you might have other questions, and also we have Psalm twenty-seven. Well, I guess my my last follow-up question is why Zebulun and Naphtali are singled out here. Is it because when we were looking at the map, they're like they're at the top, so yeah. they were they the first ones invaded? So now exactly, exactly, okay. they they are the ones sitting in the region of the shadow of death. Now, you Christians all know this because you've heard that passage. Wait a minute, that's in the New Testament. Yes, we're going to look at it in the New Testament. But before that, you have to understand its historical context in the Old Testament to mm. understand why it is that, that, that Matthew is quoting Isaiah because the situation of the people of God in, in Zebulun and Naphtali. What is Zebulun and Naphtali? It's Capernaum. It's the Via Maris. It's, it's the whole area right up there, right? I take people on our, pilgrim, our, on our pilgrimage to the Holy Land. We go up in that area. We're in we're in. Zebulun and Naphtali, you know, but we call it Galilee, Galilee of the Gentiles, right? It's yeah. uh, why Galilee of the Gentiles is the Gentiles have come down, right? And they've made homes, they've been intermarried, they've they're whatever, and the great light's gonna go out there and cast them out. Yeah. Okay? Well, what an appropriate psalm we have in Psalm 27. The mm. Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom should I fear? Amen. You know. I want to just, I, I often say this about the singing of this business, the internalizing now of this business. We're going to internalize Hezekiah. We're going to internalize what's going on among the among God's people at the time. And they're asking themselves, is, is God going to be with us or not? Is he going to be Emmanuel? Or has he abandoned his people? Hmm. And all, the ultimate answer is not whether God is going to be faithful but whether the people are going to be faithful. The Lord is my light. 
there's the question. Is the Lord your, the light of your life, Israel, Ahaz, Hezekiah, or is he not? And if he is, then he will enlighten your life. If he is not the light of your life, if you do not allow him to enlighten your life, then you will not have his light. You will be in the shadow of darkness, right? Yeah. So when we chant this psalm, and I need to say something about salvation again, because we talked about that last week. The Lord is my light, my salvation. I encourage you. I encourage you, number one, to go into a, like at nighttime or something, to turn off the lights in your house completely like you're doing this study right now in the evening go and turn off your lights shut your doors close your shades and turn off your lights and i want you to stand in the middle of your living room and ask yourself what life is like if you don't have light that's what our life is like when we don't have christ and wh- why is that because he is salvation. And what do I mean by that? What does it mean to be saved? We say all the time, Jesus is our savior. What does it mean that he is our savior? What is he saving us from? And what is he saving us for? The simple answer to that is that he is saving us from the ultimate problem of mankind, and that is death, which was dealt to our first parents in paradise. Jesus has come to reunite God and man, to make us one again, because that is what salvation is. When God's life is dwelling in us, his life is eternal. Death is destroyed. Simple as that. Jesus is the incarnate salvation of mankind because he is God, man joint. He is the restoration of what was supposed to be before the fall. Yes. So when you look at him, he is it. And it's only there that we begin to realize what we're made for, right? That he gives the the light necessary to our life to show the path toward what it means to be saved. But we have to choose that. He's not going to be a dictator. He's not going to force it upon us. So really, we could put this psalm verse in form of a question. As we meditated upon this Sunday, Hmm. is the Lord the light of my life? Is he the light of my salvation? Is he what it means for me to be saved? Hmm? And if it is, then open your heart to this reality of, of the two natures of Christ being yours. Both God and man. St. Athanasius says, God became man that we might become God. That we might be divinized, transformed through this relationship with with the lord that the two have now become one it is no longer i who live but christ who lives in me it is his will it is his way it is his life that i begin to live yeah and it's only there we can begin to see like hezekiah surrounded surrounded by the impossibility of, of the assyrian empire and what is this what does hezekiah do he says i'm trusting in the lord they're mocking him yelling at him from the from the from the from the from the outside the the Assyrian army soldiers guys are what are you doing following that crazy king up there abandon him and join us can't you see he's an idiot can't you see he's crazy and they stayed faithful and Hezekiah stayed faithful and the angel of the Lord came down in the middle of the night and destroyed the Assyrian army yeah so that's the setup that's the background that now we can hear the gospel of Jesus Christ talk about that people that sat in in the shadow of of of, of darkness all right well let's move to it matthew chapter four let me know when you're ready padre matthew chapter four here we go guys turn your bibles okay to verse 12 we go here we go let's go when jesus heard that john had been arrested he withdrew to galilee He left Nazareth and went to live in Capernaum by the sea in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali, that what had been said through Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled. Land of Zebulun and land of Naphtali, the way to the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sit in darkness have seen a great light. 
on those dwelling in a land overshadowed by death, light has arisen. From that time on, Jesus began to preach and say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. As he was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother, Andrew, casting a net into the sea. They were fishermen. He said to them, come after me and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. He walked along from there and saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother, John. They were in a boat with their father, Zebedee, mending their nets. He called them, and immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. He went around all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and curing every disease and illness among the people. Wow. Okay. So we got a lot to, we got a lot to unpack here, um, yep. father. Uh, but, but first I think we need to, to get our bearings. What has Jesus been up to ahead of this? Well, just look in your Bible, which I know is all highlighted nicely for yourselves. And you're going to see right on your page, you're going to see the baptism of the Lord. And it's all laid out there in chapter three, you see Jesus, the spirit, the voice, okay. The father, it's all there. The, tr the revelation of the Trinity um in, at the end of chapter three jesus then goes out into the desert right um and for his for the the temptations in the desert which for sake of time i don't want to spend too much time there but but uh, i i will say this that jesus goes to the jordan river he is baptized in the jordan river and immediately having been revealed as the son of god man restored to his relationship with god immediately he goes and enters into a contest with the devil. Okay. And I think this has to be read in, in the greater uh, uh, vision of, of salvation history that ultimately what's going on here is the beginnings of the restoration of our first parents, the beginning of the restoration of humanity. Jesus goes and he touches the most fundamental element of create of creation water and restores it to its its proper nature, right? To make it life-bearing again. And then he goes out and he gets himself hungry. And I like to say he, in this, in this act, he set a trap. He tempted the tempter. Because you remember who else was hungry to eat? It was Adam. Yeah. And when Adam became hungry, the evil one struck. Jesus went out in the desert and set the trap and seeing a man hungry, he knew what the devil would do, right? He would come and he would tempt him again with food. But in this time, Jesus now having been baptized and revealed for who he is, conquers the evil one, rejects the temptation and ensures his relationship with the father is first and foremost in his life. He trusted in God. Yeah. Having done this, the, the open uh, began his his uh, his ministry in this way. It says then our gospel account that John had been arrested. Remember what was taking place, right? The two brothers, uh, the sons of Herod the Great, are living there on this on the one on the eastern shore of the Sea of Galilee, the other on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee. Philip is on the eastern shore. Herod, the son of Herod the Great. Herod is on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee, and Herod on the western shore ends up taking Philip's wife, right? And John condemns him for what he did, and so he's arrested. And that's kind of where we begin the story, okay? You have to understand that it's a little confusing. Jesus kind of withdrew into Galilee. Well, Galilee is the whole area. Nazareth is kind of in Galilee, if you will. Right. Mm -hmm. But he he kind of gets out. I, I guess the way uh, you were asking me this earlier, Annie, and I think it's it's a valid question. Maybe a little more research would be good. But it says in verse 12. Now, when he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee and leaving Nazareth. He went to dwell in Capernaum by the sea. So just understand what's going on. Put the map up here. You see Nazareth. OK, where he grew up as a boy. 
right? And he withdraws into Galilee. And actually the area he kind of goes to is kind of almost campground area. You can walk along it now, along along the sea. When we go up to the, to the Holy Land, we go walk in this area. It was kind of a wild area just south of Capernaum. And there he begins his ministry right there on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee. In Bethsaida, Capernaum, Magdala, and that whole area right there on the, on the, on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, it's very beautiful and very remote. So there it is. He leaves Nazareth. He goes to Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali. Why? Not only because Herod is ruling, right? But because Isaiah had prophesied this in his day, that a great light would shine to those who sat in darkness. And then I can come back and say, And therefore, because Herod is ruling, these people who were under the oppression of the Assyrians now find themselves under the oppression of the Romans. They find themselves in darkness. And Jesus, who is the great light, is going to go and bring light to them. Yeah. And in the middle of all of that, he's going to break the clay jar, if you will, and light, let that light shine out and the darkness is going to flee. Okay, so we have that same image from Midian from the Old Testament. Okay. Yeah, so um, obviously he's he's deliberately fulfilling this passage. I mean, Matthew just tells us this. So this is kind of an elementary question, but but can you talk about, because the next line is, from that time, Jesus began to preach saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So yeah. can you talk about the role of repentance in this? Well, certainly you got to think again about the time of Isaiah and these people who are land, seeing the, seeing the land darkness, who had yoked themselves to, to Syria, right? And had the, the whole thing we've talked about on nausea, how bad it was in the North and in the South. Right. And so, and, and so of course, I'm going to go back real to what I said just a few minutes ago. God is not a dictator. He's not going to force himself upon us. Repentance is the door which opens the way to God's love. Unless you repent of your former life, of the other life you were living, you can't receive this other life. Does that make sense? It's not going to be forced on you. So repentance is the door which opens the way. And, and it, was, it was so in the time of Hezekiah. It's so in the time of of Jesus. We have to get this idea of the kingdom of heaven as something out there in the clouds, out of our heads. Jesus says it right there. Where is the kingdom of heaven? And he, is it is it up is it up there with my heavenly father? No, it's at hand. Here. Why is the kingdom of heaven at hand? What is the kingdom of heaven? The, the, the kingdom of heaven is God. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit living in a in a relationship from all eternity. This is the kingdom of God. And then, of course, all of those who are living within that life, the angels and the saints living in this communion of God, that's the kingdom of God. Yeah, it's at hand because Jesus is there. And and, and now this tension between the kingdom of God, the king, and so, so all, they're all the same, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of David, the kingdom of heaven, right? The kingdom of Israel. The kingdom of Jesus, the church, the kingdom is, is one reality, <laughs> yeah. And it is in con, it is in conflict with the kingdom of darkness, and that kingdom of darkness is represented by all those who yoke themselves to the foreign power, Syria, the Jews, the time of Jesus, who yoked themselves to Herod. Turn with me to Mark, chapter three. Verse six. Notice how early this is in the gospel of Mark, right? This is the yeah. same basic time period as we're, we're reading in Matthew chapter four, okay? Yeah. Chapter three, verse six. And this is, by the way, this is in Capernaum. The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him, how they would destroy him. Well, who are the Herodians? Are those in the court of Herod? And the Pharisees are now in cahoots with them, Okay. So when we're talking about all. repentance. We're talking about yoking yourself to a foreign power. Yeah. And Jesus is going up there to call them to return to the kingdom of God, to return to the kingdom of David for the king, for the, the son of David has arrived, but they are foreign. They're, they're yoking themselves to a foreign king. 
Okay. It, I think it helps from a, just a human geography, political standpoint. This is what the gospel, that's the context of the gospel. And it's only there that we understand that we can then apply it to our life and then ask ourselves where we're sitting yeah. and what foreign powers we've yoked ourselves to and what is most important in our lives. Yeah, but we can, that's, that's for your pastor to give a homily on. Okay. So let's go back to, to Matthew chapter four, Annie. Yeah. Okay. So um, let's talk about the calling of the first disciples for just a little bit here. So okay. we've got Peter and Andrew and James and John. And this is really kind of a, a mystifying passage when you think about it. I mean, it's like, Jesus just comes up and says, follow me. I'm going to make you fishers of men. And then they yeah. just drop everything and go. And I mean, okay, yeah. he's God. So I, I could see how that would happen, but is there something more going on here? Well, this is not the first time they met Jesus. Hmm. Now you might say, you might say, well, yes, it is. Here we are in the gospel of Matthew. They haven't met before. Yes. But in the gospel of John, in the gospel of John, we find out that actually they have met. Okay. So turn with me to John chapter one and the baptism of the lord which we just studied last week right it was last mm -hmm. week wasn't it verse 35 the next day again john was standing with two of his disciples and he looked at jesus as he walked and said behold the lamb of god the two disciples heard him say this and they followed jesus and jesus turned and saw them following and said to them what do you seek and they said to him rabbi which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, come and see. They came and saw where he was staying and they stayed with him that day for it was about the 10th hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother, Simon. Okay, so there's your first, your first connection. Who's the other guy in the story? He remains nameless. Why? Because it's John the evangelist who's writing the gospel. He never... He never calls himself out in the gospel, okay? And so he remains nameless, all right? He's the other disciple. And so we have now the two brothers of the other two brothers who they're going to meet on the Sea of Galilee. So who are these guys? Paint the picture now. These are fishermen from up in Galilee who are faithful Jews, who are looking for the coming of the Messiah, Okay, I think here of that line so beautiful in the gospel of Luke. Let's turn there for a second regarding the prophet Simeon. Okay. Hmm. The gospel Luke presentation in the temple. Chapter two, verse 25. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout looking for the consolation of Israel. He was, I love that passage. He's looking, he's looking for the Messiah. He's, he's, he's just attentive, spiritually looking. Yeah. He's in expectation. And that's what the disciples were. They were faithful Jews looking for the coming of the Messiah. They were disciples of John the Baptist. Think about that. John, the evangelist, and St. Peter, I'm sorry, St. Saint, Saint Andrew, and most likely James, right, and Peter were disciples of John the Baptist. They were going and they were spending time with him in his ministry in the Jordan River. They go on retreat with him. And then they'd say, Master, we got to go back and help our dad. And he, and he was teaching, getting them ready, getting them spiritually attentive. The lamb is coming. The Lamb of God is coming. They were looking. They were ready because of John the Baptist. So when John points out the Lamb, they go and follow him. They stay with him. Then they go and return to their father. Then Jesus goes up to Galilee and finds them. Now, how does he find them? Which is the other funny one. He's walking along the sea. He's like, hey, you'll, you'll do. Come on. Yeah. No. <laughs> exactly. No. <laughs> the location where they were fishing is known among the local Christians. Many of our listeners right now, participants, are uh, have been to the Holy Land. But I bet you, unless you've gone with the Institute, you haven't gone to the location where the calling happened because it's not developed. You have to go down, get your river shoes on. You get down about knee deep in the mud. You got to work your way through the reeds. And all of a sudden you come out. I'm going to show you a picture right here. I'll pull it up. Look at this beautiful picture. 
there of the waterfall coming into the sea. This is so beautiful, this spot. Okay, we'll, we'll pull this down now. The, the water that comes out of that spring is slightly warmer than the seawater in Galilee. So the fish, the tilapia, the catfish, all, swarm that area. You can go, you get up in the morning when you go when you go visit this place. You can go up in the morning. I've, it's it like raised the hair on my. my I, I couldn't believe it. I've never seen anything like it. In the morning, the fish are teeming so much that the whole surface of the water starts rippling because they're swimming over each other, trying to get to the warm water. Okay, so beautiful. This is the location that we know they called the apostles because it's the location where the local fishermen fish. It's just south of Capernaum. It's right there. Not only that, it's most likely the place where they're amending their nets. Why? Well, what does it mean they're fixing up their nets? They got after you walk after you go fishing, you got to go clean your nets out, right? And to clean your nets out, you got to have running water. So they go stick it under this waterfall and clear all the net out so that they can oh, fix yeah. it, bind it up, make it all right, right? Okay, so this is the beautiful location of the calling of the, of the disciples where Jesus gets them. So it's not, number one, they knew G who Jesus was. Well, they were coming to know who he was. He knew who they were. And he knew where to find them, not only because he's God. But he knew they were fishermen because they spent a day together down on the Jordan River talking to one another. And they probably told him, we're fishermen from Galilee. So he goes up to Galilee. And what does he ask? Where do the local fishermen fish? Oh, Jesus, they're down right down. See that pathway? Go down to the right there. That's where all the locals fish because that's where the warm water comes in. That's where all the fish are. Yeah. So it's wow. not by accident. My brother's pointed this out many times. And I don't know if you have, you might have other questions. My has pointed out this many times. And I think it's something that's worth saying. We get this idea that they kind of flip out at this moment. That yeah. they have this kind of experience, out-of-body experience in which they just like walk off in this drug and dupe stupor following, you know, the Messiah wearing I mean, like a purple Nikes yeah. and drinking lemonade, right? Or was it? Nikes and purple lemonade. You, know, you remember that, Dave? Anyways, uh, um, yeah, that's the idea we have when we read the text, but it's not the case at all. In fact, in a few, in just in just a, a few passages here, there's gonna be so many people following Jesus that he needs to get back on the water to get away, right? Yeah. To get out so that he can preach from the. So what does he do? He tells him, "Go get me a boat." Well, they weren't robbers. Whose boat do you think they went and got? They got their boat. Their boat's right there. It's you walk along this thing. Those that go to the Holy Land, we go walk along. I went swimming out in that bay where he got in the boat. The bay's right there, just north of this spot and just south of Capernaum. You walk just like a 10 minute walk. Okay. Their boat's there. They get their boat and they bring it. To the, same with Jesus or with Peter's house. Peter's house becomes Jesus's house, right? Peter's town becomes Jesus's town. So far from walking off and abandoning their father. Their father, Zebby's going, go, sons, go. This is, the, this is the moment we've been waiting for. This is what I've been catechizing you for. Go with him now. So they, 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 they drop, not in a way of abandoning. They, they're fulfilled, yeah. right? And they bring with them everything that was formerly theirs now becomes his. It is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. It's no longer my house is Jesus' house. No longer my boat is Jesus' boat. Everything that was mine is now his because everything that mine is his. That's the conversion that took place at that moment when, the, wow. when they became truly disciples of Christ. Wow. I have no more questions, Your Honor, on, on Matthew chapter four. Um, but as I was you know, listening to you and, and trying to think, how do we transition to this second reading? You know, you, you see like this unity coming about right under Jesus. And yet like all humans, we fall into division again. Um, mm. And, and Paul trying to call them back to Jesus in this reading to the Corinthians. Yeah. Call them I back into unity. You know, this, you know, we're going through Corinthians now in these epistles. And so sometimes it's the connection between the gospel and the epistle isn't super clear, but right. we can always draw out some connection. And I think your point is a good one about, about unity versus being or, or division versus being unified in Christ, being Christ centered in our life. And I think that's, it's applicable to the old Testament and in the new, right? Who, who are you going to be with? Are you going to be 
you know, you know, walking along the side as Jesus is ministering now, you're going to be kind of walking along the side, but you're going to be talking with the Herodians, right? The Pharisees were, were talking with Jesus all the time, but they were also talking with the Herodians, right? They're, 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 their heart is split. They're divided, right? Ahaz and Hezekiah are a great example of that. There's, a, there's, a, there's an incarnational split between father and son. Hezekiah walks with the Lord. Ahaz doesn't, right? I oftentimes think of the first thing we find out when, they, when Adam and Eve are kicked out of the garden was the next story is the birth of their sons, Cain and Abel. Yeah. Well, Cain and Abel are the incarnation of their divided, their divided heart. Yeah. And so I think this, this is applicable now too, to the gospel passage, to the Old Testament passage, and to us. So let's read it. First Corinthians chapter one, verses 10 through 13 and verse 17. I urge you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and in the same purpose. For it has been reported to me about you, my brothers and sisters, by Chloe's people, that there are rivalries among you. I mean that each of you is saying, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollo, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with the wisdom of human eloquence, so that the cross of Christ might not be emptied of its meaning. Yeah, St. Saint, Saint Theodore, Theodore of Sire says, Paul was right to add the name of Christ here. So the question is why? How, why is he? He puts Jesus alongside, right? The other guys. He was right to add the name of Christ because that was what the Corinthians were really rejecting. Yeah? yeah. When they're siding with this guy versus that guy, they're ultimately rejecting the possibility of the unity of God and man, right? Which is the only true peace and concord that we can have in, in this life. I just think we can just leave ourselves with this Psalm verse, Annie, that we have. It's, it's so beautiful here in our in our um in our biblical text today and ask ourselves that fundamental question is the lord my light is he the incarnation god and man together god and man as one the two have become one is he my salvation and i am i willing to allow him to enlighten my life so that i can see what i'm made for and then put everything else aside, leave the nets and the boats and all the concerns of the world to attain the pearl of great price. To Christ our God be glory both now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen.